And also, I just distinctly remember after Finley was born, I didn't feel like myself. Like, I didn't feel like an actual person. So I got out my fabric and my scissors during nap time and I made something. I don't remember what I sewed, but I was like, oh, this it just gave me life. Like, it made me feel like a real live person instead of just this, like, milk cow, I guess. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> and so I just kept sewing and I made robes for, like, getting ready robes for my friends for Christmas. And then my sisters wanted one, my mom wanted one, Megan wanted one. <laughs> Okay, I don't know what time of the month it is or what. <laughs> Actually, I'm postpartum, so I there really, no truly do not know <laughs> what time of the month it is. But I have been seeing, like, these arrogant or, like, antagonistic reels. Like, I feel like people are just trying to poke the button, trying to get people to comment. Always. Make the algorithm, like, jump their stuff up. Yeah. But, like, there's some ludicrous stuff out there. Um I've seen a whole bunch of conversations happening about these trad wives again, which oh. I don't personally identify as. I'm, no. I'm a homemaker. We're what? Just... I'm a 15th generation homemaker. <laughs> that sounds know. impressive. <laughs> right? There was a lady who was telling a story about how she was raised in a group. You can probably guess which group it is, but I won't say. Um, and she was raised in a group that did not – um value like education very much and they were just like you know the whole goal of life is to grow up get married have children your husband will provide for you and that's that anyway her husband left her after she had like four kids or whatever and she had been working for his business he took the business with him she has all these children she's supposed to provide for he's not giving her alimony or any of that stuff and she has no skills no education she's going for all these job interviews and she's like not qualified right. at all even though she did work for a company it was her husband's company you know but nothing on paper nothing like yeah she was a mom right her point was that people there's people out there that are just raising girls just to end up being like caretakers and mm -hmm. servants to their husbands and I was like you know what I think that's the connotation that people have of Mennonites a lot of times yeah. do you feel like that's accurate at all I mean I feel for the woman in that situation because that does sound really hard and I know you know women in our culture that their husbands have left them or maybe I'm yeah I can think of at least two wives that their husbands left them they're left providing for their kids I don't know to what extent the husbands provided financially but they weren't there physically and you know sometimes husbands die and the wife is left supporting the family and the one instance I know the wife and mom started baking and she like sold bread in stores and stuff and you know, somewhat supported her family that way. So I would say that we're not necessarily raised to just be wives and moms. We're, but I don't know. It, we are raised to take care of a home. That's what we're taught. We're, we're taught how to clean, how to cook. But I don't think it's for the sole purpose of being someone's wife. I never heard the terms like, oh, my husband's going to take care of me someday. Right. It's like you were saying, you almost got trained to take care of a husband someday in some ways. Like, yes. you know, run a household and all of that I've stuff. I've always thought of it from that perspective. I'm getting trained to take care of my family, not that I'm being raised to be someone's caretaker, like to to be taken care of by someone. Yeah. Like, I don't remember ever being told, you know, like to find a husband to take care of you. It, you're taught how to take yeah. care of a husband. And as far as like education, I feel like there is value put on it. And like people are encouraged to like if they want to go be a nurse or whatever, that's fine. But there's always that grain of like, you know, make sure if you're going to spend four years in college for something, you're going to get something out of it. The afterwards. education thing, I feel like is really equal. I think boys and girls in the Mennonite culture get the same education. Oh, yeah. for Like sure. there's no actually a lot of girls. I know a lot of girls that have went on to higher education I know more girls that have gone on to higher education than I know of men who have gone gone on to like college and stuff because a lot of single girls, they have the freedom to pursue that. And oftentimes men get Feel right into their career and their blue collar yeah. career and they don't necessarily pursue education. So I would say like Mennonite girls are educated just as much, if not more than Mennonite men. Because there's also a pressure on guys to like someday you're going to have to provide for a family. Right. And for girls, they almost have a little bit more of like, La -di da I can go on the mission field for a while or I can teach school for pennies a week, you know. Yeah, or like go that. to nursing school or whatever. Because I'll just support myself 
or someday I'll get married and have kids and Lord willing and my husband will help provide and all that. Yeah. So I don't know. It's just a really interesting conversation. I thought it'd be kind of fun to talk about that from a Mennonite perspective because obviously the word divorce is not really in our conversations too often. Like it's not something yeah. that we grow up like, yeah, 50-50 chance, you right. know. But it does happen. Yes, but it's, or not, even, it's not unheard of. Yeah. Or even in the case of death or whatever, we're not going to go out and get remarried the next day. Yeah, you know, you, exactly. There's a time period where... And we really value the stay-at-home mom aspect of things. And so mm-hmm. that's really challenging if the mom has to go out and, you know, be the provider and well, then somebody else is taking care of her that's kids. That's the thing. Even if this woman that we were talking about has skills, has a marketable skill, what is she supposed to do with her children while she's at work? Because till you pay for a nanny or daycare Ch- or childcare you know it's not coming out of the wash financially like for her to have a career and pay for childcare, it's really really hard to do that yeah i don't know i just wanted to say i don't feel like the narrative of it doesn't matter education doesn't matter all that stuff doesn't matter skills don't matter because someday you'll have a man to provide for you yeah that's not a narrative that you hear in the Mennonite circles no, really at all i haven't heard that yeah <laughs> anyway so just wanted to clear that up how's your week been you're Good. looking great. My goodness. I oh, can't thanks. miss you from... You're definitely not a wallflower today. <laughs> I, I saw this dress on Amazon and I was like, oh, that's so pretty. And I, you know, put it in my cart and forgot about it for a couple of weeks. And I went back to it. I'm like, man, I still really like that. So I think I'm going to get it. And I'll, I'll probably return it. And I tried it on. I was like, it fits me so good. The colors are beautiful, I think. The embroidery is actually like, it looks pretty good. So, and it's breathable comfy fabric i never saw a more gina dress honestly it's so, perfect we'll see <laughs> you need to take some like mother's day photos in it or something yeah i like it <laughs> um my dress is from inherit and i think what's so fun is that the owner of inherit amy yeah her and her daughter Aubrielle, designed them together like she Cute. actually i just thought oh it's just a marketing thing whatever but Aubrielle actually like puts her little input in and stuff Aww. she's like in elementary school anyway so the, this actually comes in a little girl's version that ivani has sadly she can't wear it it came and she's like, I want to wear it so bad. I'm like, I'm sorry, it's too big. You're still not an extra small. You're littler yeah. than that yet. But she really wanted to wear it. So we made a reel with it. And I put a mom hack here. She wore it backwards. So the neck was appropriate okay. height. And then she wore a jacket. And it was like, she loved it because it felt like a princess dress yeah. to the floor and everything. Aww. Anyway, so I was like, fine. Now we're going to put it back till you're like eight. Yeah. That's <laughs> but anyway, we'll try to link our dresses. if we, Yours for sure we can. Yeah. If mine's still in stock, I can link it too. So I am so excited for our next two topics yes. that we're going to talk about. Me too. I think that was they were your idea, weren't they? Well, I... Credit where credit's due. <laughs> I suggested interviewing you and then you said, well, I could interview you. Yes. So it so was we sat, mutual, but... We decided to talk to Jada first. This is not an interrogation. This is a discussion. Yes. You know, Q&A <laughs> type of thing. Super casual and fun. If you haven't picked up on the casual vibes yet here. Yeah. <laughs> Always. One bit of housekeeping before we get into it, though, is you're going to hear ads in this episode. And we've done five seasons without any sponsors. And the goal is now I can pay myself. Yes. <laughs> we've been somewhat <laughs> profitable in the last little bit. Like, I've been able to pay Jaina, our talent, and our editor, Josh. Um, but now maybe I'll be able to have a little cut of it, too, since we have some sponsors. And it's not just, like, the reason it's taken so long to find some sponsors is because we've been pretty picky. Yeah, we wanted it to fit with our brand and be something that we can get behind and support, not just some like random. Yes, I'm really excited about our sponsors. Don't click through the first time at least and yeah, see what you think. I'm excited. Yeah. Okay, so we got to do our homemaker helper segment. Yes, and homemaker we'll get, helper. Yeah, so you guys definitely leave us comments down below of any questions you want or send us dms over on honey i'm homemaker on instagram if you have any questions you just like somebody else's opinion input yeah and make them like specific like this specific happened i said this he said this and i said that and, and like, then my mother-in-law jumped in yeah and, said that. and like we really want to get down into like the nitty-gritty like dear abby type i Email think that was so fun i yes. used to devour those advice columns to my shame probably yes and we can keep it anonymous as long as you make sure you say that you want it to be anonymous. Today we're going to be talking a lot about starting a small business and mm-hmm. things like that and obviously it's really hard to do that if your husband is not on board and somebody was asking how do you get your husband on board with babysitting and can we please stop calling it babysitting when the husband is watching his own children? Yeah I saw that in the comments. One of us referred to our husbands as babysitting the kids. It was probably me and I'm just like okay if I think about it I try not to use that word because I know it offends people and Eric honestly doesn't prefer if I say that either but on the other hand if I'm scheduling it and like asking and you know getting you lined up and putting it in the calendar it's kind of babysitting 
and you're committing. Like, yeah, you're there at this time. Like, my job <laughs> is to watch the kids. I am the default primary parent, whatever you want to call it. And if I can't be there, then I need to schedule someone to do that, whether it's Eric or Annie. And I'm sorry, but, like, it's I'm not trying to be disrespectful. And I, I understand what people are saying, and I agree. Like, there's probably a better choice of words, but it's just a word, and I don't mean anything <laughs> disrespectful by it. I kind of feel the same way about that as I do with people – you know, mocking me if I, like, I don't know, maybe you guys don't have a problem with this, but sometimes if you call children kids, you're like, your kids, your children are not baby goats. Oh my. I'm like, come on. One word, two meanings. One (laughs) word, two meanings. I'm like, really? I don't know if anyone out there is still a stickler for that or not, but I've definitely had it said to me, baby goats. No. Human (laughs) children are also called kids. In our culture. Yeah. So I'm just like, words are important yes but like sometimes it's just babysitting literally means taking care of children and that's what he's doing so i personally feel very qualified to answer this question because i have oh yeah there was a question (laughs) there was a question i just went on a tangent (laughs) i have a wonderful husband who maybe by default he's just a wonderful husband but i like to think i had some proper care and training of my husband Mm -hmm. (laughs) Because you cannot expect your husband to jump in willingly and help care for your children if you're always belittling, criticizing, or trying to step in and take over when they're trying to help out. And this starts from like day one in the hospital. Like when my first born was born, Josh did all the diaper changes and all that stuff. And I like laid there and tried to recover. And I was feeding a baby every hour for like an hour at a shot and trying to get some sleep. Um, And it was like a team effort right off the bat. I looked to him to show me how to swaddle the baby because he learned how to swaddle the baby from the nurse. Mm -hmm. And this is just talking like the first hours of a baby's life. But I think it starts there. It truly does. And then from then on, you know, maybe you wouldn't roughhouse with your kids like he is. Or maybe you wouldn't, you know, give him that snack or whatever. But if you're always like stepping in and acting like you're the the foreman, the boss or right. whatever, and he's much less superior, why would they want to step in? Right. You and know? I'm just like, does this husband not watch his kids at all? I'm a little confused by the question. Like, she never leaves her children with her husband? No, if, I think it's just more like, how do you, how can you like encourage your husband to feel like more confident with okay. it? Or just, I would, yeah, I would say start with small bits of time like be like hey i'm gonna run to the grocery store and grab milk and see how it goes or even if he's really that uncomfortable with being alone with the kids just like go upstairs for an extended shower or something and leave him completely in control like if someone comes in the bathroom and asks for you be like go talk to your dad yeah no and just like giving him you know the confidence and freedom to just you're not involved for a short period of time and just go from there yeah, I don't know. I think it really, if you are one of our little sisters and you haven't had a child yet, I think if you can start with the first one, like, you know, maybe go to your Bible study without the baby if it's only going to be an hour yeah. or two or three or whatever in between feedings or something. And it might, yeah, it's going to bother you at first, but um, it's valuable time with right. your husband and the kid as well. Yeah, it's so <laughs> good for all parties involved. And Erica is great with the boys. He will even like take them away or hang out with them with. I'm home doing nothing or whatever. And he is taking the kids because he wants to hang out with them and be with them. Yeah. But we so, might have also, I mean, maybe we just have gems of husbands too. Well, I I, not I think everybody we do, is but... very capable. Not everybody feels capable, but yeah, it starts small and starts short yeah. and you can kind and of also progress I, from there. Yeah. Also, I have a six and eight year old, so it is quite different taking care of a six and an eight year old than, you know, a lot of little children, babies and stuff. I think we could do a whole podcast about co-parenting um yeah way in down below i'd love to hear because i feel like we didn't even expound on a lot of things we could have talked about yeah because we want to get into the meat of today's episode right. so yeah way in down below what else did we forget to say um any tips that you have so when i was a little girl i took piano lessons for four years cannot play a song now but piano lessons for four years and and during the summer I used to bike to piano lessons and let me tell you it was uphills both ways in the sweltering (laughs) heat all for nothing because I still cannot play a single song on the piano (laughs) tragic but if this sounds familiar to you I know a lot of us would love to learn an instrument but the barrier to entry is just too great too much sacrifice too much time and I would like to present to you guys Voteberg Music Academy. It's actually something that my family is very familiar with. Ivani is learning to play piano from the comfort of her own home. And my husband 
after 30 years, has started learning to play guitar. Music lessons don't need to be expensive, boring, or stressful. Votberg Music Academy offers online lessons that siblings can share in the comfort of your own home. Instead of dragging kids to lessons and paying hundreds of dollars a month for one student, use our code HOMEMAKER20 to get 20% off every month your children are learning piano, fiddle, guitar, mandolin, or ukulele at votebergmusicacademy.com. For less than $30 a month, you can get weekly lessons and practice printables and 24-7 access to your instructor. There's also live student onboarding calls and a video vault with tons of extra lessons for students who want to progress faster. With Votberg Music Academy, you'll never have to nag your children to practice as they work towards earning badges on their success path and performing for community student showcases. Use our code HOMEMAKER20 to get 20% off every month you are enrolled and give your children a lifelong love of music at votebergmusicacademy.com. And we will put the link down below so you guys can find that super easily. I'm really excited to see how far and how fast Josh progresses so far. He is stuck with it, so yeah, I don't know. Me his, too. his little country boy dreams are, you know, he ha hasn't given up on them yet. <laughs> Next time he serenades you in Jamaica, he can bring his guitar along. <laughs> oh my goodness, yes, my husband did do karaoke one time, and he sang a love song to me. It was adorable. It was so sweet, especially since I can't sing to save my life. <laughs> <laughs> me neither. Today I have with me a local businesswoman, the founder of Jana Lynn Handmade. She is a very creative and um, industrious, very creative and industrious professional. So, oh my, not professional. <laughs> no, I thought it'd be great to have her on today to talk. What she's on every time, but I thought it'd be great to talk today about small businesses in general. I know a lot. Almost every woman with any creative bone in their body at some point considers starting a small business, and it's definitely not right for everyone. Right, and so we're going to discuss how you can decide if this is something you should pursue. And if you're going to pursue it, maybe we can you can share some wisdom yeah. that they don't have to make all the same mistakes you did. Or I don't know. It's just fun to listen to a startup story too. And I'm not sure that my business even qualifies as a small business. I often refer to it as a micro business because it is it is a business, I guess, but it's almost more of a productive hobby in a way. Like, yes, I make money or I wouldn't do it, but it's definitely not like – a top two priority in my life it's maybe like a four or a five currently yeah micro business is probably a better word it's not like you have to meet a certain quota every month no. to make something it's like all extras right yeah so that definitely takes some pressure off for sure for sure um so how did you how did you start your business and what what pushed you to do it and how did you decide on your niche or did your niche just find you kind of tell us the beginning stages okay. so after my son finley was born my second son I just craved an outlet to be creative. So I started sewing. I had sewn before. At that point, you were just a stay-at-home mom sh strictly. That was your yeah. sole responsibility. When Jack was born, my first son, I worked um, one day a week cleaning an inn. And then when Finley was born, I stopped that. So I was looking for something else. I, I wanted to earn some money if possible. And also, I just distinctly remember after Finley was born, I didn't feel like myself. Like I didn't feel like an actual person. So I got out my fabric and my scissors during nap time and I made something. I don't remember what I sewed, but I was like, oh, this, it just gave me life. Like it made me feel like a real live person instead of just this like milk cow, I guess. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> and so I just kept sewing and I made robes for like getting ready robes for my friends for Christmas. And then my sisters wanted one. My mom wanted one. Megan wanted one. Over that time, you were also sewing like baby clothes here and there and like yeah that, uh, the you baby sewed clothes, some dresses for yourself like you were kind of dabbling I've always sewed dresses for myself I sewed some dresses for some other people like more custom type work and I didn't love that as much because it was a lot of back and forth and I'm not the best with designing or drafting patterns and making alterations and that kind of thing like I'm a, I can figure most things out with sewing and follow a pattern but when it comes to like deviating from the pattern and making something custom for someone, it's just not really my thing. So anyway, I started making these robes and then there was um, that Arts and Crafts Bazaar. Someone asked me if I would consider having a stand and selling these robes that they heard that I make. And I was like, oh, well, I mean, I guess people might want to buy them. So I got some fabric, some cheap fabric or like on discount, like just different cuts. They were all different. And I made robes. I forget how many robes. I think I might have had like 20 that I took to this robes. arts and crafts bazaar. And I sold almost all of them. I sold. 
So I had sold a lot of what I had made and I started to think, hey, people are actually wanting what I'm making. Maybe I could make a business out of this because people were telling me all along, oh, you should make them and sell them. And I'm like, no, I'm just doing it for fun. Like, I don't really, I'm sure it, I couldn't make a business out of it. And Eric was saying, why don't you sell them? And I'm like, well, I'm just doing them for gifts or whatever. I'm sure no one like wants to buy them. I would have to charge too much is what I said. After this um, event, when I saw that they were just like flying off the shelves, I was like, hey, I could do this. So I started. Do you remember what you charged for your first robe? I think 30. Okay. So they really haven't gone up in price. They really should have doubled at least. I, they're Because <laughs> I mean, um, that was way pre-COVID and all. Yeah. They're definitely too cheap. But a lot of people I saw in the questions were asking about pricing. And what I will say about that is I, I make money. I get my cost out of it. I don't necessarily figure in my time because up until now, my time was pretty much financially worthless. Like there was nothing else I could do to make money. This is what I, this is how I chose to make money. So like if I was going to mark them up to like cover, like to pay myself a livable wage, no one would want them because the product is worth a certain amount. Okay. So I didn't feel like my time was really factored in that much because I was doing it from home while my baby's napped. Like there was nothing else I could be doing to make money. So I didn't factor in you know, a lot of time payment, but I, I make money. So that's all that really matters. Or you could have gone about it another way and charged $120 per robe and sold half as many or spent some of that money on marketing. Yeah. It just depends what you wanted to attach to your name. Right. And it you wanted to have depends. good quality robes at an affordable price. Exactly. I started an Instagram, I think, or a Facebook page and I would take orders or I would list the fabrics that I had and people would tell me what they wanted. And then it really blew up when I made Megan's robe and you talked about it on your channel and then people were just contacting me right and left. I remember the day it happened. I have a picture. I'm like sitting there like I sent to my family like when Megan talks about your product on her YouTube and you can't keep up or something. You, you didn't tell me or ask me to do that, did you? No, I, I didn't know you were going to do it. I didn't even I tell I had her. no clue. I, I literally, I think it was like a morning routine that happened to blow up. Like it literally blew up when I was like creator on the rise or something. Like it got 160,000 views or something, yeah. which was like very viral for my small channel at the time. Yeah. Yeah, so it was quite the video for me it to was, put it into. I didn't even know that. Very nonchalantly. But it was know. a little overwhelming, but I got there. And then I think the biggest game changer was when my brother-in-law started designing websites. And I was like, hey, do you want to practice and make my website? And he's like, oh, yeah, sure. So he basically built me a website for next to nothing. And that was a game changer for me because I could make my product and list it on the website. I could go at my own pace. Um, so that was... I'm not sure exactly. I think that was in 2021 when he built the website for me. And that was the best thing because um, before that, I would do PayPal invoicing, which it does work. You know, if you're starting out, I wouldn't recommend spending a couple grand on a website until you know for sure that's something you want to do. So people people would, were asking about that Etsy versus Instagram versus yeah, a website. People would contact me through Instagram or Facebook Messenger or however, and then tell me what they want. And I would give them a PayPal invoice and they would pay the invoice and then I would ship it. Sew it and ship it. I would say if you have, if you can make your own website or you have someone that will help you make a website, 100% over Etsy or Instagram or anything like that because you own it. You have control. Etsy's not taking their cut. Yeah, you'll have like a Shopify or WooCommerce or whatever that are going to take their cut. But Etsy, it's fine. But like I don't have experience with it and I can't recommend it. But I think a point with talking about Instagram is you if you don't know if you want to start this business or not, like listen to the critics, listen to the people, are people asking about it? Like you, it naturally happened for you. Yes. It's what well, she wasn't even pushing stuff and people were asking for it. Right. You know, when you share something in your Instagram stories, do your 165 followers, do like three or four of them ask about it? Oh, where'd you get this? Or, yeah. Hey, could you make me one? Or like, is there any demand for this at all? You know, this yeah. is a great like testing ground for the followers that you do have. Yeah. And then once you get a little bit of interest, then I would recommend like a vendor show or a craft a craft market or something like that where you can hear what people are saying about your product. See if they're actually, do they pick it up like, oh, this is cool and set it back down and not buy it. You know, maybe you have some adjusting to do or like ask people, hey, like, why didn't you buy that? Like, what could I do to improve this product? Um, I got a lot of feedback at vendor shows some I took some I didn't yeah or like people's questions will kind of tell you a lot like if everybody's asking you is this fabric organic yeah maybe that's something you want to look into if nobody's asking about that yeah. you know yeah it's not important to them vendor shows are a great way to get word out about your product or service and you know cash and carry products 
it's a great way to make money to invest back into your business and just yeah like see who wants what so I would definitely recommend them. And I remember back in the day, you had a few that you felt like weren't great sellers, but you also felt like a lot of foot traffic went through and like you got a lot of, it was a lot of marketing. Like right. you, you got your name out there. Even and if so- I didn't necessarily sell what I wanted to sell, I would get some customers like through my website then. I was like, oh, I bet these people saw it like just based on their address and stuff. Yeah. I was like, oh, I wonder if this was a sale that I wouldn't have gotten if I wouldn't have been at that show. But I know you've often said too, it is a lot of time. It's a lot of time. Like you did it more for fun. Oh, I loved it. I don't do them anymore. Um, mostly because I don't really need to. Like everybody in Lancaster County, if they want one, they have they have one. You know what I mean? Like <laughs> I feel like my business is out there enough now. Um, and it, it just wasn't... I feel like back in the day, like 2020, 2019, 2020... I could make a killing at Maker's Markets. Like, they were the thing. They were really trendy. Everyone was doing it. Everyone was... And now they're just... There's so many of them. I think the market is oversaturated. So there's, like, three different Maker's Markets in December on every Saturday instead of there was maybe one. And you were excited about it. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, everyone went to that one. So for various reasons, I don't do them very much at all anymore. But if it could be totally different in another area. Like, maybe... makers markets are the thing in your area and i still don't think they're ever a bad thing because it's networking yeah and also depending what business you decide to start you can do a lot of shipping it doesn't have to be local but if you're like the sourdough bread lady in your area it's gonna your foot traffic is is your area more so i've seen a lot of reels about micro bakeries lately and my um eric's employee his wife started one like got her kitchen certified i think and like has a website and she puts her little stand out on her doorstep i guess and people come and buy bread and I just think that's so cool. Yeah. Or like f- little small like florist shops and stuff. Yeah. Like you don't have to have a lot of land to have, you know, flowers. Right. And it's relatively like cheap to experiment. Like if you have a failed crop the first year or like, you yeah. know, your flowers don't do that well, you can, you can start small and kind of scale it. Yeah. Someone had asked like, or a lot of people had asked, what is the initial investment or startup cost for my business? There was literally none except for the cost of fabric because I had my machine. Now I did upgrade substantially my machine after I was like, okay, this is obviously making money. I have money to invest. So I got a much better machine, but really I didn't, I did it so gradually. I didn't have a big startup cost. The website would have been a huge investment had it not been for my brother-in-law who did that for me. You know, when I was started, I was cutting with like a scissors and then I got a rotary cutter and then I got a cutting table, which saved my back. And then I got, I would buy like more thread, like different color thread, or like I'd buy fabric. First I bought fabric in like two to four yard cuts. Now I buy it in 25 yards to 30 yards. So I just gradually invested in the business. I used to print things on like pa- regular computer paper and tape it on. Now I have a label printer. So as my business grew, I bought things. And that's not the only way to do a business. You can, you know, make a big investment and get everything all at once and go from there. Like many people have started businesses that way. For me, that's just not how I did it. Yeah, I think something we did not touch on when we were talking about how to find your customer base and everything is you do really good at marketing with your um, like Instagram page and everything. Some people are not into that at all and there are options out there. You can look and see if there's somebody in your area that will wholesale your stuff mm-hmm. at, at their storefront. Um, I have Fox Sparrow, my website that I do essentially that just online. Like I have a friend who she loves making tallow bombs. She's really good at it and she just doesn't want to deal with all the marketing and right. all that. So she just sells it straight to me and then I – who have the audience and the marketing skills, I kind of market things right. out. And I do that with several different products, but it doesn't have to be Etsy necessarily. It can be something a little more niche or something more local, actual foot traffic at a, at a store. Like yeah. our your sister sells her cards and stuff in right stores. there in yeah. stores. I will say good photos are key. You have to have good photos if you want to sell a product. That's something I had really struggled with at first is getting good photos. I would try to hang them on my white wall and take pictures with my cell phone and it worked. I mean, I was still selling, but I, I think that, um, having my sister-in-law take good photos, modeled photos on a plain white background just really helps the look to be more professional and concise and consistent. And I would say if you're going to have a product, like my product needed to be modeled. So it was kind of harder than just like taking a picture of a candle or something. So I would definitely say if you're trying to, you have a product that you want to market, invest in a good camera or make a friend with a photographer that you can trade services. I often paid my sister-in-law in in products. She wanted a robe for a gift or something. So I often pay her in product, 
but you know have a relationship with a photographer because you're gonna need good photos yeah or maybe that's a skill you have yourself too and like you haven't been using your camera in a long yeah, time or too. maybe there's a business opportunity for a photographer that doesn't like to work with families or you know weddings or whatever go to a small businesses and offer to take their product photos for them yeah that's a small business in itself right there yeah. i would love to hear your opinion on influencer marketing from your side of things oh. i don't know if this belongs in this interview or the next one but i thought we could talk about that yeah. a little bit because i can tell you things that small business people do wrong when they approach an influencer but also I'd love to hear from your side of things. Have you had success with that? I have. Yeah. So the first influencer I worked with was you, which I didn't even know it was happening. Um, so that was great. <laughs> the definition like, of organic. <laughs> that was definitely the most successful one, like overall for sure. And then I also worked with Raquel Whitmer and she approached me and I had, I recognized her name because I had um, seen her name on orders. So like I rec I remember people like I see their name on the website. Then I print the shipping label. Like I see it enough times that it sticks. I was like, oh yeah, you did buy robes. So she's like, she wanted to um, get a free robe or whatever and shout them out. And it was great. And her platform was small enough that it wasn't overwhelming. And I think like, don't negate the person who has 1000 followers because they might have a really strong customer base that's going to listen to what they say. And someone that has 20,000 customers they're not going to give you the time of day or they're going to want to charge you $5,000 to, I don't know. I'm just throwing numbers out there. I have no Somebody idea. charges you $5,000 with that amount of numbers, maybe pass. <laughs> yeah, I have no idea. But I'm just saying like, you can't afford it. And even if you could afford it, do you want all that business? I mean, you have to, you don't want to be overwhelmed or like the uh, first five minutes you get sold out. That doesn't look great. Then, you know, initial the customers throughout the day go and there's nothing there. They're not going to go back probably. So you have to find someone that you're on the same level with that their customer base is type of the type of people that are going to buy your product and also the amount of people that you can sustain. So Raquel was awesome to work with. Um, just the right amount of business for me. I also worked with Katie Voberg. I think I had reached out to her. I can't quite remember. And what, what did you do though? Like you're, you sent her a robe and... Specifically. Um, I think Raquel initially and Katie, I think I just sent them a free product. Like I don't... I have paid people now more recently, like a hundred bucks or so to talk about it. But I haven't done a lot of it lately. But mostly just for free product. And I think if you're going to do that, it is like you're putting yourself out there and you have to believe really strongly that your product will benefit them and their viewers. And I think if you have a good product, I think a lot of the small influencers will do it for a free product. And I know like that's a whole controversy, like if people should do that or not. But I think if you really believe in your product, it's at least worth a try. But pick a small, a small micro influencer for sure. But I, I've liked working with influencers. I don't have any bad experiences that I can think of. Good. What I will say is though, don't just send free product and then leave a letter ex saying how you expect them to talk about it oh. or whatever, blah, 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 blah. Like your product will speak for itself and it's going to make an influencer not even want to talk about it because you're demanding that, like you kind of held them hostage. Oh, I've never said You didn't ask permission. You didn't, um, and like if you want to send stuff without asking, that's fine. Just make sure there's no strings attached. They'll shout you out if they want to. Um, but I've never sent anything unsolicited. Yeah, exactly. You need to you need to have some etiquette there when it comes to that. Yeah, or have that. a relationship. Yeah, exactly. Somewhat, yeah. Anyway, so yeah, that can be successful if you, like you said, partner with the right people. Um, yeah. How do you find a business idea that works for you? I think we kind of discussed that already and we even gave you some free ideas. But it is hard and I feel like... It I, I know I've had like a success story, so it's easy for me to say, but like, I do feel like it's not something you're just going to think of out of the clear blue sky. Live your life, do what you like to do and just see what sticks. I mean, what do you use every day? What do you like to do? And just take the opportunities as they come, say yes to things, maybe go out of your comfort zone, learn a new skill, maybe learn a new hobby just for the pure fun of learning it and just see where it takes you. Um, you're not going to make it work if you hate doing the thing or making the product. So I don't know. I guess I don't have any really good advice for that, except you can't, in my situation, I couldn't force it to happen. It just, I said yes to the opportunities that came my way, tried to be, you know, make good use of my time. Yeah. You could buy like a whole factory, a whole production, like 
you know, invest and do something or what a lot of stay at home moms I feel like are doing, it just starts like a little snowball and it yes. just like starts and rolling. I really do feel like that is the best way to be successful. And I know some of you are like, but, but what? Like I want to do something and I really don't have advice except pray about it and just keep trying, keep um, just pursuing any dreams or passions that you have without like throwing money at the wall like throw your ideas at the wall and Mm. and see what sticks but um but when you start small then you have the ability to fail small rather than just going big right off the bat and also you're developing proof of concept over that time too and you're you're making the mistakes but you're making them in front of a lot less people than making gifts i think is a great way to start like for christmas you're gonna buy the gifts or make the gifts anyway just don't even say that you're thinking about making it for a business just give the gifts and see what happens test the market Test the market there you go what do you use for tracking business expenses and all that um i use an app called expensify every time i make a sale i enter in all the information and then monthly or yearly i can print them out and see what i've spent on what and then my website tracks my sales so at the end of the year i just give all that information to the cpa how do you set boundaries as a mom versus a business owner with your time? <laughs> so for me, this wasn't a huge issue because I started the business because I had an abundance of time. So I just, nap time was sewing time. Every single nap time, almost without fail, I would sew for two hours, three hours sometimes. And then sometimes I would let my kids have some screen time while I while I sewed. And I just have such cozy, fond memories of that. They're right up against me on the sofa watching their show and I'm right here, you know, I can see what they're watching. We're right all together. Um, so I, we did that some. Um, sometimes if I was really busy, like over the Christmas rush, I would get up early in the morning and get a couple hours of sewing in before they woke up. But nap time. And you can get a lot done in two hours when you are like, this is what's happening. And you know, maybe I didn't always have the balance. Like I would get really annoyed if nap time didn't go like I thought it should. Yeah. I will say if you want a real business, treat it like a real business, show up, do what you say you're going to do, stick with your schedule. If you like, I did that from day one with my YouTube channel. Like I'm almost like OCD about every Thursday at 2.30, the video will go out or whatever, which I guess that's what I have too, kind of a small business. And my boundaries for my- Show up. Yeah. My boundaries were like, I didn't take a lot of custom orders. I was like, if you don't like what I see on the website, just wait. Tomorrow I might post something that you like. Yeah. I had to draw the line. Like, okay, now I'm making robes. I'm not going to fiddle with this and fiddle with that and make this custom for that person. Like, this is my lane and I'm staying in it. This is what I'm good at. This is what sells instead of trying to just branch out and do a ton of different things. How to handle a jealous husband when you start making more than him. I would love to know the background to this question. (laughs) Yeah, um, that's definitely not a question for me. I've not even come close. So that's a Megan question. Her husband owns multiple businesses. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, it's it's the peanuts. That's crazy though. Like, shouldn't you be on the same team? Like if you're succeeding, he's succeeding. Yeah, I I can't. Yeah. Maybe he's more jealous of your time. Maybe. Than your success. Maybe it's just like eating into the family time or something. Yeah, I, I can't even imagine making more money than Eric. So I, I don't know how that would go over. But hey, if your small business is passing up your husband's, you go girl. Yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> well, let us know down below. If you have a small business, drop it down below. We can kind of see what people yeah. are doing. It'd be kind of fun. See what niche you're in. Do you have like a beehive? <laughs> like, yeah, drop your link. Like, what do you do? I don't know. I'd love to hear because maybe, maybe there's something that somebody is doing in a different area and you're like nobody in my area does that yeah I want to try it yeah because just know. because someone else is doing it doesn't mean you can't do it too yeah I never negate you said you have a micro business but like I think a micro micro business would be just like putting your extra eggs at the end of your driveway yeah and um, if you have extra honey bringing it to family things and selling it to mm-hmm. your family my sister makes me a loaf of sourdough bread every week and <sighs> That's that's a micro business right yeah. there. So you can start small. And I think it's very important. No matter whether you want to start a business or not, you need to find an outlet for creativity and for creating beautiful things and mm-hmm. to not just be, like you said, a baby making milking machine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anyway, thank you guys so much for being here. And we'll see you in the next one. Bye. Bye.